The Jack Benny Program, presented by Lucky Strike. Be happy, go lucky, be happy, get better taste, be happy, go lucky, get better taste today. Lucky's taste better, so mild, so smooth, so firm and fresh, with better taste in every puff. Yes, Lucky's taste better. For Lucky's fine, mild, good-tasting tobacco goes into the cigarette proved the best made of all five principal brands. Let me repeat that. Proved the best made of all five principal brands. That's not an empty claim. That's a fact verified by leading laboratory consultants. For example, Foster D. Snell of New York City, who report, In our opinion, the properties measured are all important factors affecting the taste of cigarette smoke. We conclude that Lucky Strike is the best made of the five major brands. And don't forget, L.S. M.F.T., Lucky Strike means fine tobacco. Fine, mild, good-tasting tobacco. There's no substitute for fine tobacco. And don't let anybody tell you different. So remember the facts. Enjoy fine, mild, good-tasting tobacco in the cigarette that tastes better. Lucky Strike. When you buy cigarettes, remember, Lucky's taste better. Be happy, go lucky, go lucky, strike Strike program starring Jack Benny with Barry Livingston, Phil Harris, Rochester, Dennis Day, the Sportsman Quartet, and yours truly, Don Wolf. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, as you all know, in the Rose Bowl game on New Year's Day, Illinois scalped the Stanford Indians. So now we bring you a man who could use one of those scalps, Jack Benny! Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Hello again, this is Jack Benny talking, and Don, you can stop vibrating because that was the worst toupee joke I ever heard. Not only that, but it was in very bad taste. Bad taste? Yes, I don't mind for myself, but it so happens that the Stanford coach Chuck Taylor really wears a toupee. Now, now, wait a minute, Jack. I talked to Chuck Taylor right before the game. He's 31 years old, and he definitely has his own hair. That was before the game. <laughs> but when Illinois scored their, fu- uh, their first touchdown, <laughs> his hair started to go. By the end of the third period, it was piling up on the ground, and all through that fourth quarter, it just laid there and turned gray. <laughs> But, Don, that was really some game, wasn't it? Uh, it certainly was. And, Jack, I heard you were sitting right on the 50-yard line. How'd you get such a good seat? Well, Don, it wasn't easy. You see, even though I've lived in California for the past 15 years, I was born in Waukegan. So in order to get tickets, I called Governor Stevenson of Illinois. Oh, and he got you the tickets? Well, no. You see, he couldn't do anything for me personally, so he called Governor Warren of California. Well, it was nice of Governor Warren to give you the tickets. Well, (laughs) he couldn't do anything for me either, so he called Mr. McMillan, the city manager of Pasadena, who got in touch with Nancy Thorne, the queen of the Tournament of Roses. Oh, the queen got you the tickets. Tickets? (laughs) Well, not exactly. Well, then how'd you get in? I was the third princess on her right. I not only saw the game, but tonight I've got a date with the Stanford Center. (laughs) You know, the way he raved over my blue eyes, I didn't have the heart to tell him. (laughs) Don, who were you rooting for at the game? Well, Jack, I didn't want to show any partiality, so I got a seat on the Stanford side and a seat on the Illinois side. Don, how could you possibly sit on both sides of the... Oh, oh, of course. (laughs) And, Don, weren't you disappointed when you weren't picked as the winning float? I would have won, but I was sabotaged. Oh, yes, yes. Well, well better luck next year, you know? Hiya, Don Z. Well, hello, Phil. Hello, Phil. Don and I were just discussing the Rose Bowl game. Were you there? No, not this year. Well, you must have watched it on television. I start to, Jackson, but I turned it off. Phil, how could you turn it off? It was a wonderful game. I know, but I just couldn't take it. 
What do you mean? Look, Jackson, it's New Year's Day. I'm laying there with my eyes bloodshot, an ice bag on my head, the room spinning, and some character keeps yelling, look sharp, feel sharp, be sharp. <laughs> Phil. If I'd have had anything sharp, I'd have cut my throat. <laughs> All right, Phil. You've celebrated, you had your fun. Now it's time to work. The least you could have done is to see that all your boys showed up. What are you talking about? The band's here. Where's Remley, Sammy, and Bagby? Your hoodlum section is missing. <laughs> Hoodlum section? Now, hold it, Jackson. I don't think it's very nice the way you go on week after week insulting those three boys. They may not be college graduates, but they come from good families. They're sensitive, refined, and perfect gentlemen. And it's your fault that they're not here today. My fault? Yeah, if you'd have paid me more money, I could have bailed them out. <laughs> Phil, they're in jail? What for? Cross the street in the middle of the block. Now, wait a minute, Phil. They can give you a ticket. But they can't put you in jail for walking across the street. On their hands and knees? <laughs> oh, well. That's different. All right, Phil, I'll give you the money. Call up and get, call up and get the boys out. Okay, thanks. Hand me that phone. Imagine crossing on their hands and knees. <laughs> Hello? Hello, is this the Lincoln Heights jail? Well, Phil Harris, how are you? <laughs> Oh, fine, Captain, fine. Look, I called up about three of my boys. They're on the county again. Uh, which one? The three with the tire marks on their backs. <laughs> oh, those. I already released them. Well, what about the bail? I charged it to your account. <laughs> oh, good, good, good. I thought I was overdrawn. <laughs> oh, uh, uh, by the way, Phil... Hey, Phil, would you send someone down to pick up their belongings? Their belongings? Yeah, when we arrested them, one of them was carrying a piano. <laughs> I know it, I know it. One bottle opener and they got to nail it to the sign way. <laughs> I'll see you later, Captain. All right, so long, Phil. Hey, it's all set, Jackson. They'll be back next week, and I just hope that you'll treat them a little nicer. Oh, I will, Phil, I will. <laughs> Who knows, maybe the... Oh, hello, Mary. Hello, Jack. Well, you're here. Now, where's Dennis? I don't know. He hasn't come in yet. Well, how can we go on with the show if the cast doesn't get here on time? Oh, Jack, don't be mad at Dennis. I happen to know something that you don't know. Well, don't tell me. Let me guess. It's about Dennis, huh? I know. He's running for president. <laughs> Besides that... What? <laughs> Jack, this is something you won't believe All right, what is it? Well, all of a sudden, Dennis got a big crush on me Dennis? Has a crush on you? Yeah Ever since last week when I danced with him at Charlie Foy's nightclub He's been sending me notes and little gifts Dennis has been sending you gifts? What did he give you? Oh, a lot of things yeah. <laughs> His Boy Scout knife, a bag of marbles yeah. Three bottle caps, a ball of tinfoil, a fish hook, and a dead frog. Mary, you mean Dennis gave you all those... Mary, what's that you're wearing on your leg? His bicycle clip. We're engaged. <laughs> well, isn't that cute? So Dennis thinks he's in love with you, huh? Yes, and Jack, do me a favor, will you? When he comes in, don't kid him, because he's so serious about... Oh, shh, here he comes down. Hello, Mr. Benny. Oh, hello, Dennis. Hello, Dennis. Hello, Don. Hi, kid. Hello, Phil. Hello, Dennis. Uh, Dennis, I said hello. Mary, don't make it so obvious. <laughs> obvious? All I said was hello. I know, but look at how you're trembling. Dennis, you're imagining things. She's not trembling. What are you trying to do, break us up? <laughs> no, I'm not trying to break you up. Say, hey, Mary, come here a minute, will you? I want to look at you. Well, all right, Dennis. Gee, gosh. Well, what is it, Dennis? To think that you'll soon be my wife and babe will be my brother-in-law. <laughs> That's nowhere's on this page. I guess. Better than what we had written there, I know that. <laughs> now look, Dennis, Dennis, I don't want to break up your romance, but for two weeks now, I've been anxious to see Death of a Salesman. 
So do you mind if I ask your fiance, Miss Livingston, to go with me tonight? Hey, you're wasting your time, kid. Oh, I am, eh? What about Mary? Would you like to see Death of a Salesman? Oh, I'm sorry, Jack, but I already saw it. With whom? Dennis. Oh. I'll go with you, Mr. Benny. <laughs> but you saw it with Mary. Who looked at the pictures? <laughs> Dennis, do me a favor. Will you go ahead and sing your song? Okay. sung by Dennis Day, and very good, Dennis. Thanks. And now, ladies and gentlemen... Oh, Mr. Benny, I want to congratulate you. Congratulate me? Yes, Radio and Television Daily took a poll, and you were voted Radio's Man of the Year. Well, thank you, Dennis. Don't thank me. I voted for somebody else. (laughs) (laughs) All right, now behave yourself. And now, ladies and gentlemen... For our feature attraction tonight, we're going to present a sketch based on one of radio's most popular dramatic shows, Suspense. Now, in this sketch, I will play the part of... Oh, darn it. Hello? Hello, Mr. Barry, this is Rochester. Rochester, I was just starting my sketch. What do you want? I thought you might like to know. A friend of yours from Waukegan just phoned from the Union Station. A friend of mine? His name is Cliff Gordon. Cliff Gordon? Why, Rochester, he's one of my best friends. We grew up together. He said you and he were born in the same hospital on the very same day. That's right, Rochester. How did he sound? Well... Well what? Either you're over 39 or we had a very bad connection. (laughs) Never mind. Anyway, that's Cliff for you. The minute he gets in, he calls me. I hope you told him he can stay in the guest room. Yeah, but he said he was going to the Biltmore. But, Rochester, we have the extra room. Why didn't he stay with us? I guess it was my fault, boss. What do you mean, your fault? At first, I didn't know he was your friend. I'd quote him tourist rates. (laughs) Oh, yes. Mike DeSalle set them for us. Well, Rochester, when did Mr. Gordon say he was coming over to visit me? Tonight, about 8 o'clock. Oh, darn it, and I wanted to see Death of a Salesman. Oh, well, I can see it some other time. Goodbye, Rochester. Goodbye. Oh, say, boys. Now what? They just brought back your Maxwell. Good, but why did it take so long? Well, it took four days to take off the roses and two days to drive it back from Pasadena. (laughs) All that trouble and no prizes. Well, so long, Rochester. Goodbye! (laughs) 
Now, ladies and gentlemen, as I started to say, for our feature attraction tonight, we're going to present our version of one of radio's most popular shows, Suspense. <laughs> Set the scene, Don. Ladies and gentlemen, tonight we will usher in the 1952 season by presenting a sketch fraught with drama and excitement and well calculated to keep you in suspense. My name is Aristotle Fink. <laughs> it's an ordinary name. <laughs> and I'm an ordinary guy. Until last week, I was a teller at the California Bank in Glendale. But now, I'm a teller at the California Bank in Beverly Hills. No, I wasn't promoted. The rain just changed our location. <laughs> I live in a small cottage with my wife, Mary, and our 21 children. The reason I had 21 children is because at one time I hated my wife and wanted to lose her in the crowd. <laughs> but since then, we were serenely happy until that fateful day that changed my humdrum life into a tale well calculated to keep you in suspense. That eventful morning started like any other. I had just finished my breakfast and turned to my wife and said, It was a wonderful breakfast, dear, but I must leave you now and go to work. I'll be waiting for you, darling. I can't wait to return. I'll be counting the hours. I'll be counting the children. <laughs> good, good. That reminds me, you better wake Philip up. I don't want him to be late for school. Oh, here he is now. Good morning, Philip. Good morning, Mother. Good morning, Dad. <laughs> Something always happened to me when he called me Dad. But I take a little bicarbonate and feel better. <laughs> I had a few minutes before going to work, so I decided to have a fatherly talk with Philip. Philip, have you given any thought to the future? Yes, I have, Dad. Good. What do you want to do when you grow up? I want to lead an orchestra. Oh, so you want to be a musician? No, I just want to lead an orchestra. <laughs> but, Philip, leading an orchestra would be a waste of your talents. You are a great student. You are an educated fellow. You are a Phi Beta Kappa. I are? <laughs> That's right, son, you am. <laughs> And you're destined for greater things than... Uh, here's your school books and your lunch, Philip. Thank you, Mother. Did you prepare something nice for lunch? Yes. Two chicken sandwiches, an apple, a banana, and your thermos bottle is filled with milk. Milk? Yes, milk. This is a sketch. <laughs> now hurry or you'll be late for school. Goodbye, Mother. Goodbye, Dad. And I do mean Dad. All of my children left for school. And it was such a beautiful day that I decided to walk to the bank. In fact, as I walked along with the sun shining in my face, my heart was so filled with joy, I started to sing. I wish I was a swinging, clinging vine. I wish I was a swinging, clinging vine. If I was a swinging, clinging vine, I'd only cling to the gal of mine. I wish I was a swinging, clinging vine. Hi ho, fiddly dee, tell you what I'd like to be. Hi ho, fiddly dee, here is what I dream I'd like to be. I wish I was a good old lucky strike. I wish I was a good old lucky strike. If I's a good old lucky strike, I'd be the cigarette you like. I wish I was a good old lucky strike. Hi ho, fiddly dee, tell you what I'd like to be. Hi ho, fiddly dee, a lucky strike is what I'd like to be. I wish I was an LSMFT. I wish I was an LSMFT. If I was an LSMFT, I'd be so very proud of me. I wish I was an LSMFT. I hope fiddly dee, tell you what I'd like to be. I hope fiddly dee, an LSMFT I'd like to be. I wish I had a match somewhere on me. I wish I had a match somewhere on me. Cause if I's an LSMFT, I take that match and light up me. I wish I had a better voice on me. <laughs> I hope fiddly dee, if I was an LSMFT. 
MSMFT. Hi ho, fiddly dee, everyone could take a puff on me. I wish I had a hundred million friends. I wish I had a hundred million friends. If I had a hundred million friends, I'd show them I had no loose ends. I wish I had a hundred million friends. Hi ho, fiddly dee, tell you what I'd like to be. Hi ho, fiddly dee. I arrived at the bank, and this day was like all the others, with one exception. A man came to my window. A man who was destined to change my life story from a peaceful one to a tale well calculated to keep you in... I didn't say it yet. <laughs> to keep you in suspense. Watch it, fellas. <laughs> this man came up to my window and thrust a bill at me. It was a genuine $10,000 bill. I looked at him for a moment, then looked back at his $10,000 bill when he said, hey, I'd like to change this. <laughs> but, but this is a $10,000 bill. I know, it's the smallest I got. Okay, I'll change it. Would you like the change in $1,000 bills, hundreds, fifties, twenties, tens, or fives? I want it in pennies. <laughs> you, you want $10,000 in pennies? Why? I got 500 piggy banks for Christmas. <laughs> I complied with his request. Also sorry that I gave him that joke. <laughs> I gave him $10,000 worth of pennies, which he put in his pockets. And my eyes followed him as he walked out, leaving his pants behind. <laughs> I then stared at the bill and realized that I, Aristotle Fink, held this treasure in my hand. Suddenly, a harmless thought struck me. My family had never seen a $10,000 bill, and it wouldn't hurt anyone if I took it home and showed it to them. As I entered my house, my wife was standing in the hall. Hello, darling. Oh, quick, come in. Shut the door. All right, darling. Now, I want to well, show... Don't talk. Help me close the windows. They're closed now. Darling... Wait, I'm... wait. Help me open the airwick. Airwick? What's the matter? The shrimp boats are coming. <laughs> That's not important now. Darling, I have a surprise for you. For me too, Dad? Yes, for you too, Philip. Oh, for heaven's sake, Philip. Must you always go around with your pants dragging? I can't help it, Mother. I don't have a belt or anything to keep them up with. Why, Philip, to hear you talk, a person would think I don't make enough money to keep you in suspenders. I said suspender! <laughs> Stupid hoodlums. <laughs> Section. What's the surprise, dear? Something I want you all to see. Philip is here. Call the rest of the children. Okay. Sam, Peggy, Hilda, Milton, George, Ada Marie, Ellen, John, Hiller, Jeanette, Bonnie, Jean, Stephen, Terry, Harriet, Albert, Julius, Crenshaw, Pico, and Sepulveda. <laughs> All of our children got along well, except Pico and Sepulveda. They kept crossing each other. <laughs> Suddenly the door opened, and the children ran in. When I was a young man, I never dreamed that I, Aristotle Fink, would ever have so many children. The children all here, darling. Now tell them about your surprise. Okay. Now listen, you little finks. <laughs> I want to show you this. It's a $10,000 bill. Here, take it. Philip, why aren't you looking at the $10,000 bill? I don't mean nothing to me. I've seen them before. You have? Yeah, there's a little blonde in my class named Alice who's loaded with them. <laughs> All right, children, give me back the bill. Children. Children. 
Somewhere on the tour, through the hands of my children, the $10,000 bill disappeared. I looked for the money all that night, but couldn't find it. And the following morning, when I went to work, the president of the bank sent for me. I walked into the office of this very rich man. He was sitting at his desk playing tiddlywinks with silver tiddlies. <laughs> I looked at him tiddly, timidly and said, <laughs> You sent for me, sir? Yes. Do you know that $10,000 is missing from your accounts? Y y yes, sir. Did you take it? Yes, sir. Do you think that was nice? <laughs> no, sir. Well, watch it next time. <laughs> but I didn't steal it, sir. I only took it home to show it to my wife and kids. I know you didn't mean to steal it, but it's out of my hands now. There's a police inspector outside. Miss Jones, send the inspector in. Suddenly, the door opened, and the policeman walked in carrying a pair of handcuffs. He walked over to us and said, Okay, put these on, fatso. Not me. He's the guilty one. <laughs> oh, are you a fink? Yes. What's your name? You just said it, a fink. <laughs> well, what do you think, fink? You're going to the clink. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, I'm not. Come one step nearer, and I'll stab you. Look out, look out, he's got a knife. Don't be a fool. Put down that knife. Oh, yeah? Take that. Oh. Get away from me. Don't come near me with that knife. I haven't done anything. Oh, yes, you have. And I'm going to stab you, too. Take that. <laughs> I didn't shoot them, folks. I stabbed them. <laughs> but the sound man is still sore at me on account of the lousy Christmas present I gave him. <laughs> And that is my story Now I'm in my cell in the state prison Awaiting my execution tomorrow night But in the cell next to me Is a traveling man named Frederick Who was convicted of killing his wife By hitting her over the head with his sample case In a few hours Frederick walks his last mile to the electric chair Oh, it's small consolation But before I go I'll finally get to see Frederick March in death of a salesman. <laughs> a picture well calculated to keep you in suspense. Jack, we'll be back in just a moment, but first... Be happy, go lucky, get better taste today. Lucky's taste better. Friends, L-S-M-F-T. Lucky Strike means fine tobacco. Fine, mild, good-tasting tobacco. There's no substitute for fine tobacco, and don't let anybody tell you different. Yes, Lucky's taste better. For Lucky's fine, mild, good-tasting tobacco goes into the cigarette proved the best made of all five principal brands. Let me repeat that. Proved the best made of all five principal brands. That's not an empty claim. That's a fact. Verified by leading laboratory consultants. For example, Rowling and Robertson of Richmond, Virginia, who report, It is our conclusion that Lucky Strike is the best made of these five major brands. Friends, to get the facts that you as a smoker will want to know about cigarette quality, to learn the plain, simple truth about the important factors that affect the taste of a cigarette, send for your free copy of a new booklet, What Makes Lucky Strike Taste Better. Just drop a card to Lucky Strike... Post Office Box 99, New York 46, New York. That's Lucky Strike, Post Office Box 99, New York 46, New York. Be happy, go lucky, go lucky, strike today. Good night, folks. This is the CBS Radio Network. <laughs>